The twin suns were just rising over the canopy of emerald trees as I took my usual morning stroll through the gardens of our family estate on Avalon. The dew still clung to the vibrant alien blooms, refracting the soft dawn light into kaleidoscopic displays. Peaceful moments like these were one of the many reasons I had chosen to retire to this placid colony after my years of service. My reverie was interrupted by the urgent chime of an incoming transmission. I frowned at the anticipated intrusion. After decades as a diplomat and military officer for the Confederacy, I had learned that any call rousing me before the third sunrise was rarely a bearer of good news. Yes, what is it? I answered gruffly as I accepted the call on my wrist communicator. The projected hologram revealed the concerned visage of an old friend and former colleague, Samara Arano of the Confederacy's diplomatic corps. The regal blue-skinned thuvy woman's facial tendrils betrayed her anxiety. Lucas, I regret this disruption, but a matter of grave importance requires your expertise, she said solemnly. One of our research vessels has come under attack in the Corvo Nebula by unknown hostile forces. My instincts stirred as my mind raced through the potential scenarios and culprits. The Corvo region bordered territory controlled by multiple powerful species, including the militaristic Larashi. An unprovoked attack on one of our unarmed science ships could be the first salvo in a larger conflict. Have there been any demands or claims of responsibility yet? I asked, forcing my tone to remain level. No specifics as of yet, Samara admitted. However, as I'm sure you can guess, the Larashi are denying any involvement. I scowled at the mention of those vainglorious warlords. Their thirst for conquest and territorial expansion had brought them into conflict with the Confederacy many times over the centuries. If they were indeed behind this attack, it would not be their first act of treachery. What evidence do we have? Samara's hologram gestured, and another projection materialized beside her security footage from the doomed research ship. I watched in horrified silence as a brief clip played. The sleek vessel's forward cameras showed it drifting through the purple nebula clouds, its running lights blinking calmly. Then a massive dark shape appeared, blotting out the stars. The unknown leviathan ship dominated the frame with its sheer size. Before the panicked human crew could react, a blinding beam of crimson energy lanced out, consuming the unarmed research ship in a ball of incandescent fury. The debris cleared to reveal only an expanding cloud of superheated gas, the twisted remains of the once proud vessel and its crew. I clenched my jaw as the brutality of the footage chilled my blood. Whoever was responsible, this was clearly an act of aggression that the Confederacy could not ignore. Peaceful scientific research was sacrosanct under our laws and customs. This was essentially an act of war. Who else has seen this? I asked keeping my anger reined in. Just the highest level ambassadors and confederate leadership so far, Samara replied grimly. Lucas, we need you back in the capital as soon as possible. Your expertise in de-escalating conflicts and understanding the various species' agendas will be crucial in the days ahead. Part of me recoiled at the thought of being drawn back into the quagmire of intergalactic politics and the endless gamesmanship required to preserve the fragile peace. I had lost colleagues, friends to the machinations of power-hungry despots and warmongers unwilling to heed the voice of reason. Yet, another part of me, the part forged on a thousand municipal negotiations and scarred by hard-fought military campaigns to protect the innocent, knew my duty remained unfinished. If humanity's newfound role in this confederacy was to be respected, we would need to stand firm against such unwarranted aggression. With a weary sigh, I gave Samara a reluctant nod. Very well, I'll make preparations to depart for the capital immediately. Hopefully cooler heads will prevail before this situation escalates further. That's all any of us can hope for, she said with a doubtful tone. Safe travels, my friend, and be prepared for anything. The hologram flickered out, leaving me alone once more amid the idyllic gardens. I gazed up at the ascending suns, wondering if their gentle radiance would soon be outshone by the harsh red glare of open warfare. The towering metal spires of the Confederacy's capital city gleamed like silver monoliths as my transport craft descended through the clouds. 
Despite having attended countless meetings and diplomatic functions on this world over the years, I still felt a sense of insignificance whenever I laid eyes upon the grandeur and scale of the metropolis. The ancient century race that had first united the disparate spacefaring civilizations had constructed this planetary hub eons ago as a neutral point of convergence. Over millennia, successive generations had built upon this foundation expanding the cityscape into a vast labyrinth of soaring sky towers linked by enclosed elevated walkways and underground transit tunnels. It was a dazzling and daunting reminder of how small and new humanity's role on the galactic stage truly was. We had only joined the Confederacy a few short decades ago after our first tentative forays beyond our solar system. Now our very existence among these advanced cultures hung in the balance. As my shuttle descended through the bustling airlane traffic, I caught glimpses of the varied peoples and species hurrying along the bioluminescent walkways and plazas connecting the city's spires. All manner of alien and bioengineered lifeforms moved with purpose, representing a kaleidoscopic array of cultures and agendas. When my craft finally set down at the diplomatic reception halls, I was met by a contingent of Confederacy aides and security drones. Their passionless machine intellects confirmed my identity and credentials before guiding me through a bewildering series of corridors and high-speed transit tubes. Finally, I emerged into a circular amphitheater chamber, where the representatives of many of the major species were already awaiting me a veritable corporate body of the Confederacy. My eyes took in the assembled dignitaries with a mixture of awe and apprehension. The hulking, granite-skinned Zenron ambassadors stood like immovable sentinels, their duraloy exoskeletons reflecting the chamber's pale light. Beside them, the lithe forms of the Mulery diplomats undulated in perpetual serpentine motion, their gaseous bodies phasing between visible spectra, and in the center sections, seated with a palpable aura of smug arrogance, were the crimson-robed Larashi envoys, four sets of unblinking compound eyes studying the room with predatory intensity. As I took my seat, flanked by the handful of other human diplomats, a heavy silence fell over the assemblage. All eyes turned towards the raised dais at the head of the chamber where Secretary Vomrak of the Kreshik Confluence lumbered into view. The massive crustacean-like being's guttural voice rumbled out from his armored carapace, amplified by holographic emitters throughout the chamber. Ambassadors, I have convened this emergency council to address the recent attack upon one of the Human Federation's unarmed research vessels in the Corvo Nebula. As you are all no doubt aware, the details of this brazen act of aggression remain scarce. A series of angry clicks and trills rippled through the Kreshik's subsonic translator as it addressed the Larashi delegates directly. The humans have reason to believe the perpetrators may have originated from your territories. If true, this would represent an unconscionable violation of our most sacred laws and treaties. What say you to these allegations? The Larashi ambassador, a wizened and decorated veteran named K. Rath, rose from his pedestal dais. The crimson holographic aura surrounding him shimmered as his colony mind voice boomed in reply. These accusations are as insidious as they are unsubstantiated secretary. The humans remain newly arrived upstarts to our hallowed confederacy. Their brazen exploration of regions beyond their insufficient borders constitutes a threat to any who encounter their ilk. A rising chorus of angry rebuttals from the other ambassadors briefly drowned out K. Rath's tirade. He pressed on undeterred. We have committed no violation against these primitives. If anything, it is they who have invited conflict through their unrestrained aggression across sovereign territories. Perhaps this so-called attack was instigated by the reckless human crew themselves as a pretext for expansion and conquest. The chamber erupted into shouted denials and furious gesticulations from both sides of the debate. I watched in growing dismay as order broke down into chaos, realizing the abyss of war seemed to draw ever nearer with each inflammatory accusation. Diplomatic decorum was rapidly devolving into open hostility. Suddenly, a pulse of focused sonics silenced the raucous din. All eyes turned back to Secretary Vomrak, his processor nodes glowing violet with exerted authority. Enough, his voice rumbled across the amphitheater. 
This council was convened to seek resolution and adjudicate evidence, not trade insults and baseless allegations. The Kreshik fixed each of us with his compound sensor optics in turn. We shall recess and reconvene in two solar cycles time to review any proof or testimony that can shed light on these grave events. In the interim, all parties will submit to the highest standards of neutrality and truth. We will have order, or there will be no confederacy at all. As the various delegations began filing out, their aides rushing to confer in hushed tones, I caught the smoldering gazes of the Larashi ambassadors upon me. Their threat was clear. Despite Vomrak's words, I knew in my soul that any semblance of order had already begun to unravel. The galaxy stood poised on the precipice, and it would take more than simple words to change the course of the tempest brewing. The heavy Duradorn doors slammed shut behind me, sealing the antechamber where my team and I had been sequestered for days. Samara caught my eye with a worried look as the echoes faded into tense silence. Well, I asked hoarsely, was the council swayed by the evidence? The statuesque Thavi diplomat slowly shook her head, the jeweled tendrils on her scalp clinking together. They accept the data you provided implicating the Larashi, but their envoys have already sown enough misinformation and conjecture to create plausible deniability. My stomach twisted into a knot hearing her synopsis. Despite the meticulous intelligence, my analysts had uncovered irrefutable proof of the Larashi military buildup around our Avalon colony preceding the attack on the research vessel. It seemed the scales of justice had been tipped by the tyrants conniving. So that's it then? One of my human aides spat out in disgust. They get to move ahead with their plans to conquer us while the Confederacy bickers over technicalities. I raised a hand to quiet the outburst though I couldn't completely conceal my own anger and frustration. Kasana, the young analyst who had first discovered the tracking data linking the Larashi buildup to the attack timeline, looked at me with pleading eyes. Captain Vale, sir, what do we do now? Surely the Council cannot allow the Larashi to openly flout their own laws. I sighed heavily and rubbed my forehead, feeling every one of my forty-some years weighing on me in that moment. The Council has made its ruling based on the testimony and reports submitted, I said slowly. Regardless of our proof, the fact is the Larashi's status and influence within the Confederacy makes them difficult to censure without a complete legal consensus, which they've now made impossible with their empty denials and misdirections, Samara affirmed with distaste. Looking around at my team's crestfallen expressions, I felt an ember of determination flickering to life within me despite the setbacks. For too long, our species had been held back by the constraints and bureaucracy of our galactic partners. If we hoped to survive and thrive in this hostile cosmos, it was time to discard the shackles of diplomatic niceties. Listen to me, I said firmly. The Council's decision changes nothing in terms of the Larashi's intentions. We know they are amassing military forces in our space with the goal of invasion and subjugation. Their treachery and the Council's paralysis has made one thing clear they view our principles of freedom and self-determination as an existential threat to their despotic regimes. We must be prepared to defend ourselves accordingly. I turned to face the holographic star maps projected on the main display. The surrounding systems glowed with icons representing the vast fleets of Larashi dreadnoughts and attack fighters systematically closing in on our fledgling extraterritorial holdings. We no longer have the luxury of waiting for the Council's blessing or approval, I declared grimly. If we hope to protect Avalon and our other colonies from the coming onslaught, we need to take unconventional measures. My words hung in the air like a heavy shroud. Every person assembled knew I was referring to mobilizing for open warfare against the Larashi, a blatant violation of the Confederacy's long-standing territorial bylaws. To do so would essentially make us rogue outlaws in the Council's eyes. You're talking about rebelling against the entire Confederacy? Samara asked, aghast. Not a full rebellion, I clarified. Not unless absolutely necessary for our survival. But if we don't take drastic defensive actions immediately and spit in the face of their rules of engagement, there may not be a human race left to rebel in the first place. I took a steadying breath before continuing. 
the Council's bureaucracy and the Larashi's influence has made them unwitting accessories to our genocide, so we'll have to depend on our own courage and convictions from here on out, which means fighting by our own rules for a change. Tapping a few commands, I brought up a detailed schematic of Avalon's neighboring shipyards and construction facilities. Rows of civilian freighters and transports appeared, their profiles wholly unremarkable. The Larashi believe they'll be facing a scattered rabble of under-equipped fringe colonies when their armadas arrive, I said with a faint trace of a grim smile. They have no idea just how inventive and unorthodox humanity's response is going to be. Kasana's eyes went wide as the implications of my words dawned on her. Other members of the team exchanged wary glances, suddenly realizing the audacious plan I was proposing. You can't be serious, Samara gasped, turning those ships into. Like you said, the Council's decision changes nothing, I replied simply. They've left us with only one choice to fight like humans if we want to survive. With a few commands, I highlighted engine specs and power core outputs of the unassuming freighters. One by one, my analysts began running calculations, converting the harmless shipping manifests into projected weapons ranges and tactical deployment scenarios. We would take every scrap of industrial might and innovative thinking our species could muster and reforge it into an unconventional new military force. The time for diplomacy and deference had passed. If the aliens wanted to behold the tenacity and improvisational capacity of the human race in action, then so be it. We would throw their own arrogant assumptions back in their compound eyes with improvised tactics and asymmetric strategies beyond their comprehension. The Confederacy's rules no longer applied. From this point forward, the only law that mattered was our survival as a species. The holographic battle visualization flickered and strobed around me, a dizzying display of tactical data and projections. Streams of code indicated the movements of enemy ships and orbital weapon platforms in lurid reds and purples. Opposing that ominous tide were the scattered clusters of green icons our freighters, colony transports, and industrial haulers hastily repurposed into a ragtag armada. Despite the glaring imbalance of forces arrayed in the Larashi's favor, the combat sims ran through millions of scenarios per second, calculating response vectors and probability cones. A large percentage of the outcomes still resulted in decisive defeat. Yet here and there, a handful of promising contingencies emerged narrow windows where our extremely unorthodox strategies and improvisational might just hold sway against the Larashi's overwhelming numbers and firepower. I knew those were the fragile slivers of possibility we would have Torin substantiate into reality when the war came. Captain Vale? Samara's gentle voice cut through the din of sirens and weapons impacts, echoing from the projected simulation. I blinked away the far too visceral recreation of fiery ordnance and decompressing hulls, forcing my mind back to the present. Yes, I replied, shaking off the adrenaline fog. We've just received updated intelligence from Avalon, she said with barely contained emotion. Long-range sensors are tracking multiple Larashi fleets entering the system and assuming hostile attack vectors. My heart twisted into a knot. Despite our hasty preparations, some part of me had continued to nurture a naive hope that all of this mobilization was unnecessary that the Council would intervene, or that the Larashi were simply saber-rattling as usual. Do we have any idea of their force disposition? I asked already knowing the answer was not going to be ideal. What are we looking at in terms of opposition? Samara frowned and brought up a new set of holograms, displaying the ominous red iconography of the Larashi ships, bearing down on the lush green orb of Avalon. Multiple heavy capital ship contingents, at least seven dreadnoughts of the Vengeance class, along with over thirty strike cruisers and assorted fighter support craft. She shook her head in dismay. Their weapons capabilities outclass ours by several orders of magnitude. I studied the harsh angles and spindly protrusions of the hostile ships with a sense of dread. Each one was purpose-built using technologies centuries beyond our own fledgling space programs. Their mere existence was a monument to the martial traditions of the Larashi culture merciless conquerors 
who viewed us humans as bothersome insects to be crushed underfoot. How were a handful of converted cargo freighters and mining tugs supposed to stand against such a relentless juggernaut? I felt a momentary flush of doubt as I considered the impossible strategic disadvantages we faced. Until a new set of telemetry data began streaming in from Avalon itself. Hundreds no, thousands of new amber icons were materializing in the sensor grids surrounding the colony. At first flickering and indistinct, they rapidly solidified into the distinctly ungainly profiles of bulk haulers, long-haul transport ships, sub-orbital servicing rigs and industrial mining platforms. The ramshackle armada was even more wildly cobbled together than I could have possibly imagined. Yet what struck me as the icons rendered fully was not their sheer numbers or eclectic classifications. No, it was the subtle variances in engine flare and electromagnetic signatures bleeding through their improvised disguises. Everywhere I looked, I saw clear evidence of rapid, ingenious modifications and overclocked systems being pushed well beyond their original design parameters. These were not mere cargo ships taken up in a spontaneous levy for Avalon's defense. Each and every one had been stealthily refitted into a potentially devastating engine of asymmetric warfare, their payloads and drives altered to unleash devastatingly unconventional attacks. Along with the shapes emerged new streams of data, relayed from the scattered orbital control nodes, power outputs, ordnance capacities, and unorthodox deployment trajectories piped in from every nook and cranny of the Avalon system. The volume of information was nearly overwhelming, yet buried within the streams of data, fractal pattern analyzes began highlighting those narrow probability cones of potential victory. I'd seen in the earlier simulations the shrouded pathways to victory which had once seemed so uncertain and unlikely. Now, enabled by the audacious improvisations of our Avalon population, those projection margins expanded into something plausible, something tangible. My lips parted in awe as the disparate contributions of our citizens coalesced into a fully operational stratagem. All of the civilian industrial assets across the system had been seamlessly integrated into a united war fighting force. Where we lacked raw military might, we would substitute scrapyard ingenuity and asymmetrical tactics to turn our societal advantages as a species into a weapons-grade strength. Samara. I said at last, a sense of profound pride swelling in my chest. Tell all ships to assume positions. The Larashi are about to experience the full, unrestrained power of human tenacity and innovation like nothing this galaxy has ever witnessed. She looked at me uncertainly for a moment before nodding. As you command, Captain Vale, for Avalon and for the human race. I watched with grim determination as the amber icons began accelerating into their attack vectors, unwieldy shapes coalescing into an organized defense grid surrounding our naval forces. The odds were still overwhelmingly against us in every quantifiable metric. Yet the Larashi had just gifted humanity, the only arena in which we truly excelled a chance to improvise, adapt and defy the constraints of another civilization's expectations. They could never anticipate the sheer insanity of our planned retaliation. If it was all-out war they craved, then they would get a full taste of the unorthodox fury that defined our species. I just prayed it would be a strong enough remedy to ensure our survival. The war room's tactical displays glowed with an eerie crimson hue as Avalon's orbital defenses clashed with the first waves of Larashi attackers. Periodic flashes of brilliant light accompanied the screams of rending metal as ships on both sides were obliterated in blazing silhouettes. I clenched my fists tightly as the holographic grids updated with each new salvo, tracking the steadily advancing onslaught of Larashi capital ships against our improvised Zerg swarms of exo-atmospheric worker platforms and reinforced mining barges. It was a brutally lopsided engagement in terms of raw firepower, but that was precisely where we held an unexpected advantage. Come on, come on, I muttered under my breath as the Larashi's torpedo strikes systematically ripped apart the loose formations of jury-rigged ordnance platforms. Just when it seemed the makeshift defensive screen would shatter entirely, a new vector of remote-guided missiles streaked in from the upper quadrant. The improvised projectiles lashed out with searing salvos of superheated ion blasts, 
Sudden pulses of energy potent enough to rupture the stressed hulls of multiple Larashi destroyers simultaneously. A series of muted cheers went up from my command staff as the hologram showed an entire Larashi cruiser wing dissolving into expanding debris fields. Unorthodox deployment successful, Samara noted, the barest hint of grim satisfaction edging into her voice as she studied the updated telemetry feeds. Our engineering and mining crews have managed to lace those repurposed industrial missiles with an extremely unconventional payload. It should keep the Larashi off balance for a while longer, I agreed grimly. But they'll adapt quickly. No sooner were the words out of my mouth than symbols indicating the outer Larashi fleet's shifted positions, their spearhead formations coalescing into interlocking umbrella shields. Searing blasts of coherent energy lanced down from the larger dreadnoughts' emplacements, swatting aside our guided projectiles before they could detonate. We may have caught them by surprise with the initial potency of our retrofitted ordnance, but this was far from over. The Larashi's adaptive response was predictably ruthless and even more deadly. New clusters of icons manifested along the periphery of the main Larashi fleet compact, persistent markers indicating heavy missile saturation from our last remaining hidden reserves. Tendrils of guided anti-ship fire stabbed back in response, converging on the source coordinates. But instead of concentrated launch signatures, the return volley revealed little more than sporadic debris plumes. Remotely piloted decoy drones another page torn from our improvisational playbook. I allowed myself a restrained smile at the feint, even as our real counter-offensive emerged from its fail-safe posture. A surge of electromagnetic interference from the trailing moon masked the power-up signatures until the last possible second. Then, like striking serpents, the dense clusters of hardened industrial lasers and high-energy accelerator cannons opened up in a blistering, unrelenting torrent of coherent firepower. The remote mining exoskeletons and suborbital transfer barges may have lacked the reinforced armor and advanced targeting systems of warships, but they more than made up for it with brute kinetic potential. High-energy lances of brilliant blue and violet punched through the interwoven Larashi shielding in clinical sequence, gouting jets of superheated plasma through the hulls of the larger ships in grotesque unison. My eyes widened as the scale of the devastation rippled outward, a single Larashi destroyer actually shearing in half as its antimatter reactor containment faltered under the merciless bombardment. For a handful of glorious seconds, the Larashi's technological superiority proved irrelevant against the tireless precision of our repurposed defensive grid. Damage reports are extreme, Kasana reported, her voice shaking slightly. The Larashi were not prepared for this degree of kinetic potential from converted industrial assets. We've already routed their preliminary assault wave and inflicted severe casualties to their capital ships. I nodded with no shortage of grim satisfaction, even as the smoldering symbol icons continued tracking the frenzied motions of the surviving Larashi ships trying to re-establish cohesion. There was no doubt in my mind now that our gambit of desperation was working. The Larashi had assumed they were facing mere under-equipped upstart colonists with little ability to resist. Our human race stratagem of acquiring every possible industrial tool and converting it into weapons had clearly blindsided their tactical arrays. But there was still a very long and arduous road ahead of us in this system. We may have stunned them with the ferocity of our opening salvo, but the Larashi's numbers and firepower still massively dwarfed our own. This was just the opening overture in an intricate, complex symphony of violence that could last for days or weeks. Even worse, once the Larashi adapted, I knew they would ruthlessly retaliate against the very citizens who had turned the fruits of their peaceful labors into instruments of war. Avalon itself may soon become their prime target as a reprisal. Get me a status update from Colonel Suvari's ground contingent on Avalon, I ordered tersely. We're going to need something approaching real-time coordination of our surface-to-orbit defense grid if we have any hope of withstanding what's to come next. Samara's expression darkened as if reading my thoughts. You think they'll strike the colony itself soon as retaliation? I nodded solemnly. Absolutely. The Larashi have tasted our fury firsthand now. 
In their eyes, Avalon must seem like a festering den of unorthodox subversion and contamination to be scoured by any means necessary. We need to brace for the worst. High above the war-torn orbit of our adopted homeworld, the battle raged on unabated. Our unlikely first victory was already receding in the ominous shadow of the inevitable Larashi retribution. Only through rigorous improvisation and constant tactical ingenuity would we have any hope of one day emerging into the light of a hard-fought perseverance. The acrid stench of burning plasteel and ionized atmosphere hung heavy in the war room as Samara delivered the grim report. I listened in silence, my hands clenched into white-knuckled fists, as she recounted the details of Avalon's orbital defenders being systematically overwhelmed. After their opening barrage penetrated our primary energy shield projectors, the Larashi deployed a localized saturation bombing of geodisruptors across the northern and southern axial territories. The updated hologram flickered to life, displaying the charts and imagery she referenced. The once pristine blue sphere of Avalon was now marred by a series of massive impact zones surrounded by rapidly expanding rings of sickly green and orange haze. Like septic wounds, the areas surrounding the bombing sites were being visibly poisoned by some form of virulent planetary pollutants. Xenogeological analysis confirms multiple varieties of tailored seismic drivers and mutagenic particulate distributors, Samara continued gravely. They're quite literally poisoning the planet's surface on a region-by-region -region basis. I shook my head in disgusted dismay. The Larashi were employing a twisted tactic of reverse terraforming, using advanced geoweapons to render once hospitable biomass utterly inhospitable. Rather than out-and-out -out planetary bombardment, they seemed fixated on the far crueler path of slow, agonizing ecocide. Spinning the hologram, I studied the projected contamination spread across Avalon's major population centers. Sure enough, ground-level visuals piped in from the affected areas showed all too familiar scenes of infrastructure damage, hazard clouds sweeping through hab blocks, and roiling plumes of noxious smoke pouring forth from surface fissures. Fires raged unchecked in the background, unattended by emergency services completely overwhelmed by the crisis. What about evacuation efforts? I asked hoarsely. Please tell me we have at least begun extracting civilians from the worst hit areas. Samara met my gaze levelly. Our naval forces are running continuous airlift sorties wherever possible, but many regions are simply too contaminated or active for safe recovery operations. The bulk of the planet remains cut off. Unbidden, my thoughts flashed back to those final lingering moments on Avalon before the outbreak of hostilities strolling peacefully through the lush, color-drenched arboretums and gardens surrounding my estate. Such tranquil and nurturing scenes now lay poisoned and befouled by the Larashi's vindictive reprisals. And what of our defense grid? I pressed on, shoving aside the swell of despair vying for my attention. Have we managed to achieve any kind of workable coordination with Colonel Suvari's remaining ground assets? At last check-in, the Army's orbital rail gun platforms and torpedo batteries were still functional and integrated into our system, she replied grimly. But the chemically renewable ordnance stores are rapidly being depleted as they struggle to target the Larashi's precision geostrikes. A series of updated holograms highlighted the remaining concentrations of military ground positions across Avalon's continents. Dozens of automated missile silos, Gauss accelerator batteries, and bunker-mounted beam cannons lit up the translucent globe. But the stark truth remained these decentralized assets were becoming more isolated and surrounded with each passing hour. My gut twisted into knots as I weighed the near-hopeless tactical scenarios in silence. While the initial audacious ferocity of our counterattack had stymied the Larashi's attempt at a brute force invasion, their adjusted methodologies were rapidly gaining traction. Simply put, we lacked sufficient resources or manpower to mount a proper planetary defense against these unrelenting bombardment operations. The longer the conflict dragged on, the more starkly asymmetrical the attrition would become. We were burning through the last of our improvisational ammunition and gambit tactics before my eyes, and the Larashi showed zero intent of easing up. A sudden series of proximity alerts shattered my morose ruminations. 
multiple vectors of scarlet symbols emerged from the upper hemispheric projections, dispersing into concentrated attack formations. Sir, Kasana called out in alarm. We have a massive influx of capital warheads inbound from the dreadnought fleets. High-velocity incursion profiles consistent with antimatter dispersal bombardment. I felt my heart seize up in horror at her report. Antimatter warheads, the very doomsday weapons that had once scoured entire continents to radioactive ash and drowned cities and uppling mega-tsunamis during humanity's darkest conflicts of old. And now the Larashi intended to unleash that same indiscriminate apocalyptic firepower against the very cradle of our burgeoning interstellar civilization. If those ordnance payloads reach surface detonation, Samara said urgently, the impact plumes alone will trigger an extinction-level event across Avalon. There will be no recovery from that degree of fallout contamination and particulate dispersal. My hands trembled as I watched the remorseless trajectories playing out on the targeting monitors. Every thermal transit path terminated amid large population centers and vital habitation zones. The Larashi were not deploying some limited punitive strike. This was an outright saturation bombing intended to render the entire planet uninhabitable for the next thousand cycles at minimum. I found myself paralyzed, unable to vocalize the orders that our command crews so desperately awaited. What defense could possibly stop the wave of annihilation bearing down upon us from countless directions? How did one fight back against an enemy utterly devoid of conscience and dedicated solely to our extinction? Forcing back the waves of dark despair, I squared my shoulders and stared down the threat projections as if sheer force of will could repulse them. My voice came out flat and devoid of any inflection. Broadcast Directive Hades Zero to all allied assets. We have no choice but to commence the final pyre protocols. A crushing silence fell over the war room, as if even the populated spaces of the chamber were holding their communal breaths. The crew all understood the gravity of those code words in an instant. I closed my eyes, inhaling one last time the sense of a living, thriving world on the verge of oblivion. For Avalon, I concluded solemnly, and may the Creator have mercy upon us all. The rumbling thunder of ordnance detonations reverberated through the armored bulkheads of our command bunker in waves of jarring concussions. I gripped the edges of the tactical holo table until my knuckles turned white, silently praying that each earth-shaking blast represented another devastated Larashi strike formation repulsed before it could deliver its payload. Status report, I shouted over the cacophony never taking my eyes off the swarming icons depicting both sides' fleets in a dizzying orbital blur. Samara fought to make her voice heard over the din. Our defensive umbrella is holding. For now, the solar ionization mines we covertly seeded across Avalon's lagrange points have helped disrupt most of the initial bombardment waves. But antimatter ordnance is still leaking through in scattered triple-strike vectors. Right on cue, the entire bunker shuddered from a nearby detonation potent enough to trigger seismic alarms. I watched grimly as the holomap's outer colony indicators flickered out one by one whole cities and habitation zones winking out of existence in blazing superheated clouds of vaporized ferrocrete and silica. Even if we somehow managed to repel or disable the long-range Larashi barrages, the retaliatory damage was already initiating a cascading wave of planetary death throes. Automated monitoring systems screened out a litany of warning telemetries atmospherically disruptive particulate dispersals, biospherical toxicity spikes, compromised life support grids, and radiated fallout zones exponentially expanding with each detonation. Avalon was dying. The cradle of our species' first true steps into the vast cosmic society now lay thoroughly poisoned by the Larashi's vindictive brutality. Centuries of cultivated verdance and pristine colonial development were being scoured from existence in mere hours, and we seemed powerless to halt the ecocide. Sir, Kasana called out urgently. I'm reading near saturation failure of the central planetary shielding array. If that collapses completely, nothing will be able to stop the bombardment. Teeth gritted, I stabbed a command into the holographic interface. A series of new icons flared into the orbital telemetry grids, 
resolving into the hazy outlines of improvised weapons platforms and superheated ordnance vectors. Then we'll have to take this conflict directly to the Larashi vanguard, I growled in response. If they want to settle this via overwhelming firepower, then we'll oblige them. Sure enough, the converted industrial arrays and mining platforms positioned across Avalon's equatorial belt began unloading their full retaliatory capacities, unleashing a tsunami of high-energy kinetic impactors and revectored thermal containment fields directly toward the heart of the Larashi invasion force. Shielded gunboats and resupplied torpedo frigates from what remained of our orbital naval reserves formed up behind the hodgepodge civilian craft, adding their focused volleys to the maelstrom. Symbology indicating crippled enemy destroyers and buckled armor integrity momentarily cheered the weary techs manning the sensor grids. But it was a hollow victory at best, a mere flash in the grand scheme of annihilation raining down upon Avalon's billowing surface below. There were simply too many Larashi ships committing to overwhelming force. I felt my body reflexively brace as another tremor shook the subterranean chamber. This one was more sustained and violent than the previous blasts, corresponding to a massive spherical detonation rippling out from the western seaboards. My eyes narrowed as I watched the incandescent bubble of residual energy expand, swallowing up cluster after cluster of orbital assets and habitation zones in its thermobaric wake. It, it can't be, Samara stammered in disbelief. I leaned closer to the projection grids in numb horror, confirming the telemetry projections even as escape pods and debris plumes materialized amid the blinding flare over the ruined megacities. One of the Larashi dreadnoughts had broken through our outer defensive umbrella and initiated full antimatter decompression at near-stratospheric depth. A man-made sun of extinction now hung amid the smoldering remains of the capital biomass and civilian population centers vaporizing millions in a single apocalyptic instant. The scale of such a calculated atrocity was nearly incomprehensible. Logic could barely process the depth of malice and sociopathic depravity required to unleash a weapon of such indiscriminate devastation. I felt my gorge rising as the images of the firestorm's aftermath washed over me. Until a wheezing transmission crackled from the calm arrays. Command. This is ground force Zyphro's have zero plea for God's sake. They turned it. To glass. I slammed my fist against the console as the scattered voices of dying soldiers cut out in sputtering disbelief. This was no mere conquest or purging of a new colonial threat to the Larashi. This was an outright extermination, pure and unrestrained, and the enemy seemed to revel in their scorched earth vindictiveness. At that moment, any naive hope that we could appeal to the Larashi's sense of restraint or abide by their dictates evaporated entirely. There were no rational actors on the other side, merely remorseless monsters utterly committed to the eradication of our very existence. They would settle for nothing less than Avalon's complete and permanent desolation, wiping the very principle of humanity from the stars. The orbital defenders have ceased functioning. A shell-shocked Kasana reported tonelessly. Fallout and particulate levels are maxing our sensors. Life support systems failing in in every sector. Red emergency klaxons began wailing as reports of systemic biospheric collapse continued piling in. I met Samara's eyes across the holoterminals, seeing my own weary resignation reflected back amid the strobing crimson glare. Perhaps a month ago, I might have continued advocating for a diplomatic solution or last-ditch appeal to the Confederacy for mediation but watching the pyres of Avalon's dying colonies rewrite the very face of the night skies, I knew that any further diplomacy would be the very cruelest illusion in the face of the Larashi's scorched earth reality. There was but a single path left for the survival of humanity, a zero-sum scorching of worlds and a refusal to go quietly into oblivion. If the Larashi wanted unrelenting total war, then by the Creator's name, that was precisely what we would give them. The hollow projection of Avalon hung like a ghostly specter amid the dimly lit war council chamber. Or what remained of Avalon, I should say. The azure jewel that had once symbolized humanity's first true foothold among the stars now smoldered as a ashen, pockmarked orb of radioactive ruin. I forced my gaze away from the haunting sight, 
instead focusing on the solemn faces of the ambassadors and strategists arrayed around the curved plasteel conference table. So many newly hardened expressions, aged beyond their years by flames of conflict scarcely any of us could have fathomed just months before. A damning silence hung over the gathering like a suffocating shroud. Giving voice to our collective sense of grievous loss and simmering anger seemed an insurmountable task. No words could truly convey the devastation we had all borne witness to the wholesale eradication of not just a colony, but entire worlds of possibility cauterized by the Larashi's genocidal fervor. At last I found my voice coarse and brittle. We are humbled by your respective species' steadfast solidarity in the face of the Larashi's atrocities. I paused, unsure how to even summarize the full magnitude of Avalon's fall in adequate terms. The losses we have been forced to endure defy quantification. Samara reached across the burnished table surface, gently clasping my hand in a supportive gesture. The elegant Fava matron's face remained impassive and serene, yet the subtle undulations of her cranial tendrils betrayed a roiling current of visceral anguish beneath the surface. You led your people with honor and bravery in the face of extinction itself, Lucas, she said softly. The memory of Avalon's sacrifice shall not be forgotten. I managed the faintest of nods, unwilling to voice the true extent of my self-recriminations. How many untold millions had perished because of my tactical misjudgments and overconfident hubris. If I had pursued more tempered diplomatic avenues or never provoked the Larashi's merciless retaliations, could different overtures have preserved Avalon's existence? Such doubts and regrets now felt utterly futile, of course. The cruel finality of our adopted homeworld's fate had irrevocably shattered any chimera of stability or rapprochement with a Larashi regime. They had bombarded us with the harshest truth of all the galaxy's ruling elite viewed the very existence of humanity as an unacceptable contamination to be scoured from the stars. No amount of appeasement or restraint on our part would ever be enough to preserve our hard-won colonial footholds and fundamental liberties. This was nothing less than a war for the very survival of our species, and we had no choice but to rise united if we hoped to endure the Larashi's genocidal fervor. My gaze drifted over the remaining representatives of those precious few alien cultures who had pledged support and solidarity to our cause Centaurans, Trombans, Illyrians, all bound by a common outrage against the Larashi's atrocities. Their numbers were dishearteningly scant, but their presence alone gave me strength to carry on the fight. If Avalon's extermination was meant to serve as a brutal object lesson about the depravity we faced, it had also unexpectedly revealed a deeper undercurrent of unity and common ethics that transcended individual species' boundaries. No longer were we viewed as mere upstart primitives, unworthy of inclusion among the star's vaunted elite. Now we had earned a terrible right of validation through our shared sacrifice and determination. You honor us with your presence, I said gravely to our remaining allies. All I can offer in return is my solemn pledge this transgression. This Larashi extermination of Avalon shall not go unanswered or represent a portent of human subjugation. For as long as a single one of us remains to draw breath, we shall meet this aggression with unwavering resolve. To my surprise, a chorus of affirmative nods and murmurs of hard-fought solidarity rippled across the assembled delegates. The fiery trombone ambassador Voktraz gave a cutting salute with his energy side limb. To that pledge, the Tromban Protectorate Alliance will commit the full capacity of our armadas and warriors, Captain Vale, Voktraz growled with feral enthusiasm. We have witnessed your tenacity and resilience in battle firsthand. We would be honored to fight alongside such a cause. The taciturn Illyrians exchanged a series of cryptic gestures before their ambassador, Huron, addressed me in his sonorous billion form resonance. We of the Illyrian Techno-Councils have already begun diverting resource streams and computational matrices in support of your species' martial mobilization, Huron intoned with what passed as warmth in his synthetic existence. Do not mistake our inorganic nature for a lack of empathy over these heinous transgressions of Avalon. We abide and will render due opposition to the Larashi's genocidal aggression by any means necessary. 
I felt emboldened as similar affirmations of solidarity echoed around the table nods of respect and acknowledgments toward humanities suffering from races who had previously dismissed us as entirely inconsequential. It dawned on me that Avalon's utter desecration seemed to have catalyzed a profound shift in the political dynamics underpinning this increasingly polarized conflict. What the Larashi had clearly intended as a brutal subjugation to cow humanity into submission had instead transformed us into the nexus of an unexpected moral coalition, a rallying point against oppression and the defense of personal liberty in defiance of totalitarian genocide. Our very existence had become a line in the proverbial sand over which the dominance-obsessed Larashi regime could not simply stomp. I felt the faintest spark of grim determination flicker back into existence as I nodded to each ambassador in turn. Then we are decided. The Larashi bombardment of Avalon and the resulting atrocities will not be permitted to stand. Our united forces shall strike back accordingly with whatever contingencies must be brought into alignment. Samara met my gaze with silent approval before adding, Lucas speaks true the time for placation and feudal appeasement has ended. Only direct confrontation remains by which we can preserve any sense of self-determination. She raised a crystalline glass in solemn toast. Let it be known across all encoded frequencies and secure calm channels. Today marks the formation of a new galactic alliance, united in the principles of accountability, liberty, and the prescription of genocidal aggression against any sovereign ascribed culture. One by one, ambassador after ambassador joined Samara's toast with their own ceremonial gestures of solidarity and acknowledgement impromptu words of shared purpose, cutting across once irrevocable cultural boundaries. As the chamber filled with the echoes of resounding affirmations, punctuated by the haunting ashen visage of dead Avalon hanging overhead, I felt the weary stirrings of resolve take root. The Larashi had committed an unforgivable act of apocalyptic barbarism against my people. That much would never be permitted to pass without severe reprisal. Yet in doing so, they had also sown the seeds of their own unwitting undoing catalyzing a righteous, unified opposition unlike anything this galaxy had previously known. Avalon's genocide would not stand. The score would be settled, and the perpetrators humbled not through the nihilistic slaughter they so embraced, but a retributive restoration of balance that would resonate across millions of years to come. At last, the ragged edges of my soul found purpose once again. A leader had something worth leading. A soldier had a cause worth fighting for. And the galaxy entire had gained a tireless bulwark against oppression. The dazzling emerald expanse of Avalon's restored biosphere shimmered in the brilliant sunset like a newly reborn jewel. I gazed out over the sweeping vistas and crystalline lakes from the polished fairglass viewport, mesmerized by the sight unfolding before me. Avalon lived again, its hills and valleys blanketed in lush regrowth and teeming with vibrant new ecosystems. Of the charred, irradiated wasteland that had remained after the Larashi's genocidal bombardment, not a single visible scar persisted. The planet's miraculous renaissance stood as both a profound relief and powerful testament to the collective dedication that had made this improbable restoration possible. My God, it's even more stunning than the biosimulations projected. I turned to see Samara standing beside me, her lithe form gilded by the fading amber rays slanting through the observation lounge. The Thuv ambassador's jeweled headdress glittered as she inclined her head in reverent wonder. Even for someone who had borne witness to the scope of our galaxy's marvels firsthand, Avalon's rebirth proved nothing short of transcendent. The great terraformer would have been awed, she murmured referencing one of the most esteemed architects of planetary renewal in our alliance's ancient history. Our people never lost faith, I replied simply, unable to keep the surge of pride from my voice. Even after the darkest depths of the Larashi's brutality, we stubbornly clung to the belief that Avalon could be redeemed and our ideals resurrected. Samara regarded me with her piercing cobalt eyes. Your perseverance shames me, Lucas, I confess there were times when even I questioned the feasibility of this endeavor. To have reclaimed and reshaped an entire world thought utterly destroyed by antimatter scourging. I shook my head, 
still unsure how to properly articulate the profound magnitude of what our people had collectively achieved here. Over the course of nearly two decades, we had somehow defied the limitations of our technological hubris and the constraints of nature itself. The turning point, I recalled, had come mere weeks after the Larashi's butchers of Avalon had finally been routed and the embers of rebellion effectively snuffed out across outlying star systems. As the first fragile embers of our newfound alliance's victory consolidated, an audacious proposal had emerged from within humanity's scientific rancromid smicto tsunami Avalon's scorched and poisoned surface. At first, the projections bordered on statistical impossibility, the meteorological, geological, and atmospheric matrices required to rehabilitate such an utterly scoured terrestrial body seemed hopelessly complex. A dozen different fields of xenological and exo-terraforming theory all concluded that the scope of the project would require entire generations of meticulous calculations and resource expenditures. Avalon was simply too far gone. Yet, as so often seemed to occur when humanity's existence hung in the balance, our scientists and engineers stubbornly refused to abide the limitations of current theory. With reckless abandon for academic constraints, they formulated an entirely new hybrid approach, a holistic computational model extrapolated from an intricate, interlinked, unified terraforming field. Where conventional methods sought to tackle a dead planet's revitalization in painstaking incremental components restoring atmosphere, adjusting axial tilt, catalyzing hydrological cycles, reintroducing flora and fauna, the unified field theory proposed a far more audacious simultaneity. By essentially synchronizing and phase linking every conceivable factor and variable into a harmonized systemic matrix, a veritable symphony of planetary rebirth could theoretically recede Avalon all at once. When the staggering resource requirements and logistical impossibilities of orchestrating such a massively parallel framework were tallied, more than a few allied voices counseled abandoning the entire far-fetched notion. Even with our combined productive capacities diverted from the war effort, assembling a coherent system on that scale verged on cosmic improbability. That was when the Illyrian fabricators and constructor fleet unveiled their masterwork a new breed of semi-sentient, self-replicating terraforming modules infused with revolutionary hexamuan strata field technology. If properly seeded across key strategic coordinates, these exponentially expanding clusters of constructor drones could then begin weaving the interlocking submatrices for the unified field in molecular precision. Over the course of nearly five years after the final shots were fired, an intricate web of these seeding modules was disseminated across Avalon's surface and orbital trajectories. Then, like a phoenix awakening from the smoldering husk of its own extinction, the planet's formerly irradiated and barren substrate erupted in an ever-expanding lattice of hyper-accelerated terraforming activity. In mere months, the nightmarishly toxic atmospheric envelope choked with particulate toxins and radiation was scrubbed and renewed down to the molecular foundation. As new thermalized air currents and weather systems emerged across the cleansed stratosphere, the reactivated hydrological cycles flash catalyzed verdant continental regrowth in their wake. Entire collectives of pre-programmed plant and insect life surged outward from the seeding sites in synchronized succession, cross-pollinating with ferocious potential. Within only a few short years, the pristine paradise that had once defined Avalon was reborn the former scars of cosmic genocide utterly erased from existence. And now, as the fiery sunset washed over renewed majesty surrounding us, I understood the truth at last this world stood as vivid affirmation that no atrocity or subjugation could ever truly extinguish the tenacious spark of our defiance and ingenuity. No matter what devastation the Larashi had wrought, we would simply rise anew and reshape our destiny according to humanity's transcendent resilience. Just as we had done here on Sacred Avalon. And that's how we reclaimed Avalon from the ashes of the Larashi's cruelty. I surveyed the rapt faces of the classroom, scanning the wide-eyed expressions of the students, some human, others distinctly alien in appearance, yet united by their shared reverence. Despite being mere children, their gazes shone with an unmistakable solemnity, as if instinctively comprehending the weight and hardships distilled into my recounting of our people's tribulations. 
the perseverance and sacrifice of that era ensured humanity's continued existence among the stars, I continued, allowing the full depth of those words to resonate throughout the vaulted auditorium. We did not simply endure the darkness of oppression and genocide, we transmuted it into the light of a new interstellar sovereignty and age of unity with our allies. A small jade-skinned hand rose tentatively from the middle row. Excuse me, Elder Vale, if it is not too difficult, could you clarify what you meant by the promise of a name keeping the defeated Larashi on Avalon? I felt the corners of my mouth tug upward in a wistful smile as those words conjured recollections over a century old. Even in the twilight of my life, certain pivotal moments remained etched into my consciousness with pristine clarity. Of course, young one, I replied with an indulgent nod. You see, many of our most implacable Larashi foes remained on Avalon, even after their invasion was routed and imperial armadas forced to withdraw back to their ancestral territories. In accordance with the terms imposed by the Council of Worlds, they were to act as overseers and wardens, you might say. Puzzled looks creased the students' alien features as they struggled to contextualize such a seemingly contradictory notion. I pressed on, savoring their youthful inquisitiveness. You must understand the Larashi existed under a highly regimented system of cultural identity and militaristic societal conditioning. Every member of their sectarian empire was indoctrinated from birth with an unshakable belief in their species' innate superiority and divinely ordained right to utter dominion over all other civilized worlds. As I spoke, a series of holograms flickered into existence courtesy of the auditorium's archival systems. Ancient transmissions from the Larashi regime's glory days played out in miniature ceremonial parades and rallies dedicated to the glory and conquests of their home worlds, lavish brutalist monuments and architectural marvels constructed to imposing scales that defied imagination, fleets of dreadnought warships numbering in the billions. To the Larashi of that era, warfare and subjugation represented the exclusive path to achieving ultimate reverence and respect concepts that were absolutely integral to the perpetuation of their species across all territories, I explained. They measured military triumphs and breadth of conquest by the weight of whatever grandiose titles, honorifics, and naming rights could be bestowed upon them. Underscoring my words, the archival recordings now displayed the lavish pomp and ritual that accompanied the rechristening of Larashi warlords and sector armadas. Lofty battlefield nomenclatures like Shobakara Incendiary or Kauritak, the consummate narrated in solemn, honored gravitas as newly conquered star systems and seeded worlds were ceremoniously appended. So you see, in the wake of their crushing defeat attempting to exterminate Avalon. Our alliance confronted the Larashi survivors with an unprecedented proposition, I said, letting the weight of the moment hang palpably. Those who willingly remained on this world would be granted their own sacred promise of a name the opportunity to reforge their identities and shed the blood-spilled ignominy of the past. A second chance at attaining cultural reverence, but through preservation and reconstruction rather than conquest. The holographic projection transitioned to archival footage of some of the earliest days following the restoration efforts on Avalon. Legions of battle-scarred Larashi veterans could be seen reinforcing terraforming matrices and energy grids, their formerly intimidating armor and weaponry now being wielded towards harmonics of renewal and sacred groundkeeping. For some, the path forward had required literal purges of their once oppressive ideological conditioning. Yet as the seasons passed and Avalon's lush rebirth continued unfurling around the survivors, even the most obstinate centers of resistance gradually found a sense of renewed spiritual identity, one intimately bound to their role as sworn guardians and nurturers of the revitalized world they had once sought to exterminate. Where the Larashi had once turned Avalon to smoldering glass and irradiated oblivion, their descendants now drew sustenance and solace from their sworn duty to uphold this sacred world's continued prosperity. Each new generation of indoctrinated youth shed the burdens of their ancestors, sins to embrace the rights of planetary stewardship. In time, former monikers of conquest and belligerence fell to rot on the branches of their ethnic memory. Those desiccated husks were supplanted by new titles of spiritual reverence, world wardens, the life-keepers of Avalon, 
and other such esteemed honorifics bestowed by the grateful citizens they had once sought to obliterate. Does that help explain the significance of granting them that promise? I asked the classroom. How even the perception of one's identity and cultural worth can be utterly transformed through a commitment to heal rather than defile. Understanding seemed to dawn across their youthful countenances. A few nodded solemnly, their admiring gazes never wavering from the visual records being presented. In many ways, the rebirth of Avalon itself stands as enduring testament to that core truth of our unity, I concluded softly. Once freed from the shackles of hatred and the Larashi's dogmatic oppression, all of our interwoven peoples proved capable of sublime transcendence and spiritual renewal. Leaning back into my anti-grav suspenser chair, I allowed my gaze to drift past the enthralled students and out through the paneled viewports. There, the azure skies and forested valleys of modern Avalon rolled out in an endless panorama of verdant serenity, placid, nurturing, and forever poised to embrace new generations of the once shattered yet perpetually defiant Plurali's human dream. Our indomitability had at last found its purest coalescence and spiritual embodiment. Perfected in the shadow of our darkest hour's tribulation, reforged from the ashen remnants of a genocidal purging, the most enduring aspect of our species had been irreversibly crystallized. Our resolve would forever persevere and scatter the tyrant's ashes upon the star garden of liberated worlds. Until the very stars themselves surrendered their light, Avalon would stand watch over that eternal vigilance. Some promised ideals simply could not be unwritten or negated, no matter how thoroughly their chroniclers sought to scour them from existence. In the end, the transcendent radiance of wisdom and fortitude would eclipse any shadow of subjugation's malice and arrogance, and in that truth, endured the ultimate sovereignty of a human soul.